Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of State of the Newsroom Malawi 2021, which has a focus on corruption. I'm Alan Finley from Bits Journalism, and I helped coordinate this issue, which was produced in collaboration with the Continuing Journalism Education Initiative in Malawi. Before I hand over to Vitas Gregory Gondwe from the Platform for Investigative Journalism in Malawi, uh, who will introduce our guests and facilitate our panel discussion for this launch, I would like to invite Professor Franz Kruger, Head of Department at Wits Journalism, to say a few words. Franz? Thanks so much, Alan. Um, and welcome from our side to everyone who's taken the time to join us for this uh, online discussion. I mean, you may know that we, as Wits Journalism, are active in a large um, number of different areas around journalism. We have interest in community um, journalism, we have interest in investigative work um, in radio and in a number of other areas. Um, and our State of the Newsroom in South Africa has been published for quite a few years. And I think I can say it has really contributed significantly to the discussion about media and media issues in this country. So we were incredibly excited to find that we had the opportunity to work with partners in Malawi um, to develop a concept um, in that country. Um, so this is the first time that this concept has been um, used elsewhere on the continent. Um, and it is already fascinating. Um, I mean, it looks, uh, from at first blush, it looks fairly similar to our product, um, largely because the design work is being done by a, um, a similar set of hands. Um, but the content really is quite different. And just to pick out one particular instance that, that drew my attention, um, and I've already used it in a, another project that, it's, that, that I'm working on. Um, the report says that there has been a decline in newspaper readership in Malawi, not as in many other countries because of the impact of digital media, although I'm sure that is also a factor, but because of the increase in newsprint, price of newsprint. And I find that fascinating. And I think the point that needs, that emerges for me is how complex African media landscapes really are and how one really needs to drill down into the specifics of various countries in order to get the kind of richly nuanced understanding um, of, of what is going on. Too much writing about African media simply assumes a kind of across the board view which um, standardizes um, in a way that really reduces the complexity of the situation in a way um, that is unhelpful. So there already, I think, for me, was an immediate um, benefit, I think, from doing this work. We did this in partnership with a number of groups and people in Malawi, and has already thanked them and referred to them, and I want to add my own thanks. Thanks for working on this, putting up with us, um, uh, in order to produce what I hope is a useful exercise for Malawi and for the rest of the continent. Of course, I hope that we can extend the con concept further and that in future we will see other countries um, involved in developing analyses of their newsrooms, the state of their newsrooms. I'm way more interested in the discussion, so let me be quiet. Uh, but thanks again to everyone involved, both um, in the audience and as the panel. So back to you, Alan. Thanks very much to everyone. Thanks, Franz. <clears throat> As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, this issue has a focus on corruption, but it's not, as you would have gathered from France, it's not just about corruption. There are the standard sections for the state of the newsroom publication, um, including a newsroom in reviews, uh, the indicator section, uh, two, two articles on the challenges Malawian journalists face in the newsroom, such as low pay and unsustainable conditions of employment, as well as a discussion on how politics, amongst other issues, impact on media sustainability in the country. But as the articles also show, corruption is in effect a part of these challenges, such as producing a sustainable and independent media. And even when it comes to journalists being paid peanuts, as one interviewee in an article said. So this edition, which not only looks at corruption in the newsroom, but how the print media has reported on corruption is a fascinating read. It is also an important issue, I believe, because the authors have shown the courage to talk about something that is going on in many other African countries, as we have seen more and more through various revelations in South Africa. And so we might consider this the start of a broader conversation about journalism ethics across the continent. 
To talk about this edition and to introduce our panelists and take the discussion forward, I'd like to hand over to uh, Greg. And just to mention that Greg and Abel Mwanyungwe um, from the Polytechnic in Malawi were the two key um, editorial and production people um, and coordinators in Malawi. Greg, um, over to you. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, all protocols observed. Now, uh, as we continue celebrating the launch of the first ever State of the Newsroom for Malawi 2021, I draw your attention to the three eminent media personalities that will lead a discourse that will center around the inaugural issue that is basically focusing on the corruption in the media in Malawi. But before I lead in the discussion, I will humbly ask each one of them to introduce themselves and a little bit of what they do. Uh, I will start with, um, okay, I, I will not mention them, but I will start with any of the guests can pick it from there. Yes, Gretchen, maybe you can be the one to begin. Okay. <laughs> you said you wouldn't use the name, so okay, fine. Um, my name is Gresham Kubula. Um, I'm a media consultant at the moment. I have um, been in the media since 1994. Worked for um, two of the country's major media houses, National Publications and Times. I also had a stint uh, with um, the British High Commission. Yeah, but I've, since uh, 2015, I've been doing media consultancy, facilitating workshops, and uh, doing some. Um, various works for different organizations. Hope that does it. Uh, maybe, maybe I can just add. I can just add that the Gretchen is the, one of the contributors of the report. Yeah. Can you unmute, Edith? Edith. If you can unmute. Unmute. Uh, my name is Edith Kambalame. Um, I work uh, for Nation Publications Limited, uh, publishers of The Nation, Weekend Nation, and Nation on Sunday, um, deputy editor. I, I, I've been in the newsroom for over 15 years. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. And, and Edith is also chairperson of uh, a, a grouping of media, women media uh, practitioners. Yeah, Association of Women in Media in Malawi. Chair, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Temukanga. I'm uh, the chairperson for the Media Institute of South Africa, Maui Chan. Thank you so much. Now, throughout the period that we have been talking about this launch, we have dwelled on the fact that a third of the country's budget is lost to corruption each year. Uh, bring us most of the times to several questions, one of which is uh, what can the media do about it? Maybe I can start with you, Edith, to look at aspects of the role that the media can take considering the losses that we are we, we are experiencing through corruption. Yeah, that's a good uh, perspective. I think uh, what we need to understand is to, to, to appreciate the cost of corruption uh, on, on our economy and on um, 
on individual citizens in Malawi. I think uh, if we understand that, then we will understand that we have a role to play, not just as the media, even as citizens, because this fight against corruption requires concerted efforts. And I also believe that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. If there were no enablers, then journalists would not be able to you know, compromise themselves in terms of how they handle it themselves regarding uh, corruption issues. So I do believe that um, as media, first of all, is to understand our position in society. We are called the fourth estate. We have a role to hold the, the authorities, the government to account on these um, on various issues, you know, that are uh, of public concern. So at the moment we see that something is not uh, adding up or they're not playing their rightful role. Um, I think it's it's to us as, as journalists to play our role, to come up and say what what is happening here. And also to do that is uh, one of the things I think that the, the report has revealed is that sometimes, and we have seen this happening, Sometimes we see that uh, media, the media, especially the print media, will publish interesting uh, and powerful investigative pieces, but there's need to follow up on those issues as well to see them to their logical conclusions. Because we see that sometimes when we break the story and then we leave it there, that doesn't help. And uh, one of the other, one of the things I think as, and the journalists themselves is to realize that their job is actually a calling. There are so many challenges that have been outlined in the state of the media, uh, or the state of the newsroom report, such as low pay, uh, maybe long hours and stuff like that. But I think that if a journalist recognizes that they are there to defend uh, the public good and, and that their job is actually a calling, then they will play their rightful role, or their rightful role in, in, in society. I think for now, I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, maybe Gretchen, you can pick it from there, considering that the one of the contributions that you've made into the report also borders on the uh, corruption within the news and wars. Thank you, Greg. Um, I think, first of all, I want to uh, start with the figure that we mentioned. You mentioned about a third of our resources going down um, uh, because of corruption. I first heard this figure in 1999 when the then director of public prosecutions, Fahad Hassani, wrote it out. I really don't think that we're still talking about it there. I think we should be talking about something a little higher now, uh, given the extent to which uh, corruption levels have, uh, have gone. Now, coming back to your uh, cracks of your question, I would like to say the first thing that has to happen is for journalists to, to personally hate corruption. Because you have to, first of all, to, to hate it as, as, as an individual. Um, so I, I, that, to me, that's the first point. Journalists have to hurt corruption as individuals. Because what, uh, what has happened in Malawi is that certain things have become normal. Um, we have normalized corruption. We have, we have made it a way of life. So until and unless, we, uh, Unless we we reach a point where I have to hate, I have I, 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 uh, I have to have the passion against corruption. It will be difficult to defeat it from within the newsroom. So, to me, the first point is for us in the media, what as it does, whatever position we are holding, to hate corruption and to just to agree with it, to understand the cost of um, uh, of corruption, how it affects us personally. Um, as individuals before we, we uh, before we become journalists. So that's the first point. Um, and then secondly, the point that I would like to make is that um, our coverage, yeah, again, to, to going back to what you did say, our failure to follow the stories to their logical conclusion is part of this culture that we have not internalized the hate uh, for, for corruption. So if we hate corruption, what we, what we need to do is to actually to look out for for it. Um, because it, you don't have to struggle much to, to get a hint of um, uh, corrupt practices somewhere. So I think we need to look for it, just like the police do, just like the law enforcers do. We need to look for it uh, and fight it with a passion. 
And what that means is um, we need to, um, um, first of all, highlight good practices. The few people that are acting out of character, or yeah, I'm using that word because I think corruption has become no more and formalized, as I say. So the, the few people that are showing signs of uh, uh, acting differently, those have to be promoted. We we'll promote um, uh, good practices, and at the same time, we hold those that are supposed to punish um, lawbreakers to account. We need to follow it, which follow um, to follow um, what has happened from the time we have published the story. We have to take interest in the stories that we have published. We are not just there to give out the stories. We need to follow. We we publish this story. Did you, did you did you read our story? Did you listen to our story? Did you watch our story? What are you doing about it? Even help the law enforcement uh, to, 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 to get certain leads because uh, they may not be where you were or you may, they may not have the kind of information that you have. You, we have to help them. But I think to me, the bottom line is we need to get corruption. Uh, uh, Chair, um, you, 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 you are the torch bearer when it comes to promoting advocacy and the, the rights of journalists or media practitioners. But here we are also faced with these accusations of corruption. I don't know, uh, based on what Gretchen and the Edith have explained, what is your take in all the pointing fingers to practitioners? Mm -hmm. No, I, I do think that um, while indeed we are playing a critical role um, in uh, exposing corruption, there are definitely some areas that we need to do more. And unfortunately, because of the power that the media holds uh, to be able to expose individuals in government, in high powered offices, uh, that people are indeed maybe um, involving themselves in corruption. It is also a very delicate position to be in. And that also brings about so many uh, temptations uh, uh, to the media. And I, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that I think slowly we are beginning to have some conversations on corruption actually existing in the very newsrooms where we think um, uh, individuals would play a critical role in exposing the same. So we have become a part of the problem. But unfortunately, uh, Gregory, um, is the fact that we are not as open to discuss individuals who are reportedly um, corrupt in the newsrooms. And that makes the conversation a bit difficult or in trying to find a solution, we, are, we jump because we can't really take anyone to task simply because everyone seems to be afraid. And I, I, I have read part of the report and uh, I want to reference to it that uh, there were some, some accusations where journalists reporters are accusing editors that they kill stories in courts simply because maybe they have received some bribes. And I wanted to say, I think the problem is, is, in, is in the entire chain. There have been moments where we have received reports without, of course, concrete evidence, because anyway, corruption is very difficult for you to get evidence. Um, where judges have also lost stories simply because someone has, has bribed them. And the same report, uh, state, of the, uh, state of the Newsroom, uh, has also indicated that some of these are coming from the fact that journalists are poorly paid. So if you look at the landscape in Malawi, yes, we are being accused, but the problem is very difficult for us to root it out simply because we, are is, we easily accuse each other, but we can't name who is doing it, number one. And number two, it's also very difficult to deal with because we are also low paid. So there's that huge temptation. I mean, if I just receive this bribe, I will be able to pay for my rentals for six months. When uh, with sorry, I struggle. So when you look at all those factors, um, you find that the problem may actually get bigger if we don't address these small, small issues and begin to acknowledge the fact that the problem may actually be among ourselves. 
And unless we are broad enough to name who is doing it, that's when we'll be able to deal with it. We have named other in, uh, politicians, you know, people in high offices. Why are we failing to name each other if the problem is among ourselves? So I think it is a challenge for us that let's not go on talking um, in, in veiled speeches. Let us point fingers where they're supposed to be pointed and then we'll begin to solve the problem. Unless we do that, this may actually, uh, the problem may actually get bigger and we will be, um, we will be faced with a challenge of um, dealing with corruption when now widened. Let's deal with it right now when maybe the problem be a bit, a bit small at a lesser scale. So that would be my contribution. Uh, in the sense that yeah, corruption may exist, but we don't really know who is in what at the moment. And we have good conversations, fair conversations, truthful conversations, that's when we can begin to, to see that. And media has to begin to look how we pay our just much bait to be able to fight corruption. Oh, thank you, Chair. So uh, there we are. We're talking about corruption, but we are not pointing to the identities. We, we don't have faces of those that are involved within the news. Maybe from there, we can also look at the issues of uh, the outside players. And uh, this brings us to our second and third question. How does political influence impact on reporting corruption? And just how widespread are the first-hand reports of corruption among journalists in the Malawian newsroom? Now, I want the, our panelists to tackle this question together with a question that came from a contributor from Liberia uh, within the week. As you know, during this period leading to this day, we have also received several comments and questions. So one person from Liberia wanted to, to know if we at all, the reason why we, we, we have uh, corruption within the newsrooms is because we have not restrained or there are no legal requirements, legal requirements that can restrain politicians from my in owning radio stations or in other media platforms. Because to, according to the contributor, this is the entry of corruption in the, in the media. I think uh, I will start with you, Gretchen. Uh, first, discussing how political influence is impacting on reporting corruption and just how widespread are the first-hand reports of corruption amongst journalists in Malawian newsroom. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Gretchen? Sorry, uh, just as well, I'll start all over. Um, the problem we're having in Malawi is is that, um, I don't know whether that's the situation in other countries, but I'll speak uh, more confidently about Malawi, is that um, the people with money all want to go into politics. Uh, you find that every, there's, a, there's almost every, every business, businessman is a politician, or every politician is a businessman, something like that. So the people with money are also uh, politicians, and they, they are the ones that have the muscle to, to even own newsrooms. Um, when, when Chair Teresa was talking about um, the poverty that we have as journalists, I think what also came to mind, to mind as she was speaking is that our newsrooms are themselves poor as well. They're very under-resourced. Um, we, it's difficult for us to go out there and do certain stories. And therefore, for us to be able to cover stories, we rely on news, the news sources. Um, that already compromises us because we cannot, we, we cannot resource our own stories. We cannot fund our own stories. So we, we rely on people to, 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 to fund our stories uh, because our newsrooms do not, do not have enough money for transport. They don't have enough money for accommodation. We, we are just under-resourced as newsrooms. And uh, because of that, we rely on news sources uh, to fund our stories. And if they are corrupt people, it's difficult for you to, uh, to, 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 to bite the finger that feeds you. So it becomes, that, that's where the problem is that. So the problem really is that the people with money, are mostly are politicians, and most of politicians have, are, are owning business, businesses. So you, 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 you would be in a situation where uh, almost every media house would be traced to a politician uh, or to a, a very strongly uh, politically connected family. So 
that already compromises you. You cannot uh, fairly cover uh, the culprits or the people that are in, in, engaged in corruption because you are afraid uh, of, um, of, um, of, of, of losing your job. Um, the second part of the question is uh, how widespread uh, the stories of corruption among journalists. Um, Chair already talked about uh, the whispers that go around the newsrooms, but without really putting faces. But if you don't put people on the spot, if you don't, if you're not putting people on record, people will discuss who's doing what. Uh, the only the only thing that becomes a problem is when you want them to speak on record. But if you if off the cuff among ourselves, we know. Um, who is involved in corruption, uh, who is doing what, who is doing what, who is, do, who is linked to who, who is funded by who, who bought whose car, who bought whose house, who bought whatever. I think those things are, we discuss them. And uh, among ourselves, I think we know them. I think the problem that is there is that we are not ready to, 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 to name uh, the people that are, that are doing it. Um, I think uh, we accuse ourselves of overprotecting each other. I think we, as, as a profession, I think it, it happens in, in other professions as well. We, we try to protect each other. We, uh, we, I mean, away from the camera, away from the, uh, from, 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 from the microphone, we can say this one is involved in corruption. But once the mic is on, once the camera is on, you don't want to discuss that you want to, because you want to protect uh, one of your own. So I think that's where the problem is. But I think the discussions are there. Privately, people discuss who is doing what, with who, where, and how. I'll stop there. Uh, OK, uh, I think, Edith, we, I, I, you've, heard, you've heard what Gretchen has just talked about. And I uh, would love to hear what's your take in, the, in, in this specific question. I mean, I totally agree with what Gretchen and uh, Teresa have said regarding uh, the fear of, of us as media people to tackle the problem from within. I think we often assume that corruption is happening out there and that it is our job to expose the corrupt doings. But as I said earlier, uh, corruption doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's got enablers. And one of the enablers, as, 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 our, as my colleagues have discussed, is, um, is the media itself. And um, I think also from the report, you can see that the factors that are contributing or worsening this problem, such as low pay uh, for journalists and uh, lack of uh, job security, it, it, it reduces the commitment of, of journalists or reporters to the job, even editors, I might, I might add. Um, but I, and, and I think that uh, politicians have capitalized on this. They know, they know how to capture the media uh, right by their, their, their weaknesses. I think um, it's very important then to go back to what uh, I think Gretchen said earlier, that the, there has to be a choice, a personal choice uh, to, to reject corruption because, I mean, the challenges are there. We all know them and I'm sure uh, they exist in other professions as well. But if you know uh, why you are in journalism and what your role is to play in that field, then you will be able to, to uh, reject uh, any corruption and focus on, uh, on the public good. I think that uh, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, partisan politics at, at uh, media house level, um, it's kind of tricky because as uh, my colleagues have said earlier, we've seen that most uh, media houses are in a way affiliated to uh, a political party or some politicians or maybe they support. They have, we've seen especially of late that some media houses that we thought were independent are actually showing signs of, um, of political leanings, which is very unhealthy for a democracy because then what you get is biased reporting, the inability for for such media houses to, to expose corruption or do investigative journalism. And uh, I think without investigative journalism, uh, it, it, you can't have a strong democracy because there's, there's no one to hold uh, uh, authorities uh, or duty barriers in check. So I think um, it's also up to the media owners and media houses, media institutions to understand that yes, you can have ownership 
that is uh, linked to a politician, but the role of the media in a democracy. What is it and how do you contribute to it? You, if you understand that, it's, it's possible, I believe, to be independent even with, with, with a, even with, um, with, with that situation where you're, you're linked to, I mean, the ownership is, is, is political. I mean, as Gretchen has uh, said earlier, it's very rare to see um, uh, a business person who's not linked to some kind of political party that owns a media house and, and vice versa. So it's very hard to, to actually detach ownership to politics, but we can make a choice to say, we are in the media to play this role. And how do we how do we uh, uh, um, uh, how do we do that without uh, actually compromising our role in society? Thank you so much, Edith. Um, Chair, you, you know, uh, as the Mr. Chairperson, you've always dealt with politicians for various reasons, and here we are thinking that perhaps there is political influence that is also impacting on the reporting corruption. I would like to have your take as well. Uh, and, and of course, you can also look at the issues of whether uh, we should allow politicians to manage our media. But as the as Gretchen as, as I rightly said, all the, the people with big with deeper pockets are the ones that are into politics. Basically, they are also the ones that are going to to, to invest in, 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 in media outlets. So where do we stand there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let me just uh, quickly apologize. I've switched off my video because it was dragging. Um, but to answer your question, to be honest, already right now, so many media houses in Malawi are in some way being supported by a politician or politician. Um, we have a law in the broadcasting area. Uh, where, of course, the Malawi Communications Regulatory Authority should not register or license a media house whose ownership is attached to politics. That, that, is, that is clear. Um, unfortunately, though, we have also seen the same macra um, registering media houses afterwards we learn that the ownership, actually, you can trace it to a politician. And that becomes a bit of a problem, especially when these politicians are in a position of power being the ruling party. Let me also remind, um, uh, just mention that even where a mid house is not necessarily attached to a politician, sustainability of media houses is also driven by some political force, especially coming from government. Now, even where you divorce media house from any connections from political uh, personalities, you still find that we are reliant on a political system to get funding or our sustainability at least should be, is driven by some political form. And even where now you, you are not connected to a politician, see, because you get advertisement coming from the government where you have people in the ruling party uh, making decisions, it becomes a problem sometimes to bust them because they can easily withdraw, withhold advertisement, and then it will become a problem on your own. So it is a very huge dilemma we are in. Um, suffice to say, I, I have to commend some media houses, which even in the face of um, huge challenges, financial challenges, where governments have withheld funding or advertisement, they have still continued to be professional and uh, uh, done some investigations, earth shaking investigations at the expense of what I would call their own sustainability. We have seen that they haven't died. The professionalism has kept them going. And we therefore maybe can see how we can still survive, even though it will be difficult. But with, if, if we are really professional, we should be able to make some money from people who are appreciative of, of our work. So I think as, as Edith said, we need to have a commitment, even where we're affiliated in some way to politicians or not, but there will always be some repercussions if we, um, we write um, or we expose some, some, some corrupt tendencies by some individuals. There will be some repercussions, but let us in the first place 
get to realize why are in the field? Why are we in the media sector? And once we get the, the reason we are in there, the others, the other things, the other factors will follow. So I, th I, I thought that maybe I should do that. We are not saying that there is no invest great investigative journalism on in Malawi. There has been some, but obviously we can, we can, we can do better to expose the same and, and get to a commit that even where we know that I will expose someone who may be in some way uh, 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 attached to our media house, I think there is a reason, there's a better reason for us to still um, go ahead, go ahead and write. But I want to acknowledge it's a very difficult position and I don't think it is, it is easy. Uh, Gretchen, there, there are a few questions for you from, uh, I think, Steve Morris. You, you, the question is, Gretchen, this fear that you talked about, the fear of speaking on record, is it primarily for fear or retribution? Is it primarily for fear or retribution or more subtle, not wanting to be seen to be the one acting badly against police? It's the latter, basically. Um, we, we, we're a family, we, we chew together, we mix together. So you don't want to, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we want, we're protecting each other uh, as professionals. You don't want to be seen as the holier than thou, this one. So you, you, you discuss in, in, in hushed voice, uh, but you don't want to, to, to report or to be seen as you are. And, uh, unless, unless, for example, you are, like in my case, uh, I was an editor for a long time. Unless it's some, a junior of mine, and I want to to to, um, to discipline them, it's easier to, to do it that way. But if it's a, a colleague from another media house, I've heard or whatever, you you, you because it's, you have no uh, official capacity to women to 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 discipline that that kind of person. So all, all you do is discuss in harsh voice. Um, uh, but if you are in a position of authority, like I've like I've been, and somebody is involved in corruption, you take it and, and you're bad. Um, you 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 had some evidence, or the, you follow it up. We have had I've, 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 I've sat on this, several disciplinary this, hearings, uh, following up on colleagues that have been involved in corruption. But only in that official setup, when you're, you're in an you in an organization, and something has uh, has um, surprised you, you follow it up. And the, the people have gotten fired in uh, where I've worked because of corruption. So it, it's possible to do it in in, in that setup. But where it's a somebody from another media house or somebody else, we don't want to discuss that. We don't want to be seen to be um, fighting colleagues. So basically that's what happens. But I just wanted to say something. Um, um, we, I, again, from, from, from personal experience, I, I want to agree with what Chair Teresa said, that um, when a politician owns a media, house it depends on why they are they are having that media house there are there are some people who have opened media house uh, media houses for political reasons and when you have a media owner who is there who is in the business for for political reasons it becomes very difficult for you to um work professionally but when you work for a politician who has taken her own the media house not for political reasons but as a pure business it, it's easier and i was fortunate to work for that kind of politician um, where you, you, you see that a politician is not even standing in your way. And it's, uh, and it's a huge cost, as, 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 as Teresa said, it's a huge cost to them as politicians. They lose, for, they lose uh, the trust of their friends because they are, uh, their friends see them as if they are using the media house to fight them. But all they're doing is to leave you to, uh, to your own devices to work as professionals. So they will leave you to work on your own, but they, their colleagues in, in, in politics will, look at it differently. They think this colleague is using his media house to fight us. So um, the point really is, why are we in the media industry? Is it for business or is it for, 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 for politics? If you work for a politician who is there, who is in there for politics, it becomes difficult. But if a politician who owns the media house is there for business, and I've seen it work, things, things can, 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 still be, um, uh, can still be safe. The other thing that we are also missing out is that we're only mentioning politicians, but some of the corruption is also done by the private sector. Mm -hmm. And it's tackling in, in, in very big money. The private sector is also uh, uh, affecting the kind, the kind of coverage um, that, that, that we, we, we do. Um, I know media, big companies that have threatened to pull out 
uh, millions of kwacha uh, uh, in advertising because you, you you do not cover their story in the right way or you exposed some um, characteristic, uh, some deal that they were, they were involved in. So it's not just politicians. The big companies as well are a threat to uh, our freedom in trying to uh, fight corruption in the country. Okay, uh, th there's also a question from, I think, Undule Magasungula. I think uh, maybe, Chair, you can help to answer it. Uh, Undule is asking that on law motivation in the media houses, can media bodies such as MISA or Media Council address this? Media cannot be exposing abuses taking place somewhere while themselves are being abused or their rights being violated. No, um, I, I hear you. And, uh, and it's a conversation that we have had in the media schools. Um, but I think what Gretchen said earlier on in terms of the newsrooms or media houses also struggling on their own um, has been evident. Uh, for instance, Misa Malawi has engaged media owners previously to just kind of try to understand um, uh, why we have journalists being paid so poorly and if there is something that can be done. Um, but from analysis, we have also seen that uh, most media houses are, are really struggling. And that is also evident in the debts uh, that these media houses um, have. They, they sometimes fail to pay for certain services. Um, and and, and we, they, they have expressed the same, that yes, we can employ uh, but for us to pay very well, we'll probably need to be making so much. So the media houses are struggling financially, and therefore that will also translate to the journalists being paid poorly. But that is not to say that I think something should not be done. There was, I think, one media owner uh, who suggested that maybe we need to begin to teach our journalists, entrepreneurial journalists, so that while they are writing, there should be also a way on how they can translate whatever we are publishing into money for the media house. And then that will also translate into better pay. Um, but yes, let me just acknowledge Undule that yes, it's something that we continue to have as a position, except the media owners have also indicated that it's not like they have huge chunks of money uh, seated somewhere and that they're choosing to pay the, 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 the journalists poorly. It's, it's because they don't have the money. So I think the solution should, we should find a solution that would help the media houses make more money and therefore that would translate to the journalists themselves. Um, the report mentions, for instance, uh, the issue of prices for uh, newspapers, yeah, which over the years has gone up and that has decreased the readership. The, the readership. Um, that at first we thought would be the solution, especially for print media. And unfortunately, it, it went to be a disadvantage because now uh, the, the newspapers are not selling as much because of the price increase. So we have to really find heads uh, once more to find a solution where the media houses still make m good money and therefore they can pay uh, the, the journalists better. Uh, I would like, I would, I would love if you could do answer this question from Albert Chala. He says corruption in the newsroom is a 3D issue in which media owners, editors, reporters are enablers. The blame has largely gone to the reporters and editors, but he is so interested to know from the panelists, looking at newsroom set up in Malawi from newsroom perspective, that do we have internal structures that can curb control corruption, or how do these systems, if any, work and what can be done to strengthen them further. Say if a politician buys a reporter or an editor, how can these internal systems stop such employees from abusing the editorial? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think uh, in uh, various newsrooms have editorial policies that speak to how you conduct yourself as a journalist and the repercussions for uh, breaking the rules, as it were. And so it also applies to politicians buying, you know, uh, journalists or reporters. And um, I think some, someone has already alluded to this, that there's always a question of proof. And I think that's the one thing that stands in the way of media houses acting on people 
that are rumored to be uh, uh, working for politicians uh, in their journalistic way, uh, in their journalistic work. But I think that for those that have been proven to be indulging in corruption or, or soliciting uh, bribes uh, from politicians or, or the private sector or anybody to influence their coverage of a, of a, of a news story, uh, we have seen, at, at, at least from the organization that I work for, people being fired. I know a couple of people, a couple of people that have been fired for that. But um, where you don't have proof, it's difficult. Uh, but I've also seen in the same vein that uh, some media organizations will have some people that are sort of protected because they are skilled, they are very good as journalists, and they, they fear that if that person is gone, they may not be able to sustain the level or the quality of journalism that they that makes that that helps build the, 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 their name, you know, as as a as a media outlet. So they will hear rumors, or they may even be presented with proof. I don't know, but they will choose to look the other way. They will bury their heads in the sand and say, "We cannot lose this person." So those people may be protected either subtly or openly, and then journalists within the newsroom will know that this person is untouchable. Even though we report, even when we report them, nothing is going to happen. Then they will just, I mean, look and observe and not do anything about it. But I think we also have to give, give credit to those um, uh, situations where we've seen uh, media houses actually taking action against uh, 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 those journalists that are breaking the rules and uh, uh, reporting for certain individuals or political uh, structures. Gretchen, uh, Undule also was uh, conversing with Franz, saying he believes zero tolerance lies in the hands of publishers, media owners, and editors who act as gatekeepers to sit down and seriously address the problem of media corruption. But now, uh, what Franz is saying is he, he was going to ask you, the panel, as to who should take the lead. Is this something for professional bodies or as you say, employers or government? So who should take the lead to end corruption within the media establishments? Uh, you, are, you, are, you are muted, you are muted, Grayson. Yeah, I don't know who starts, but um, in my view, the owner, Hello, hello, Gretchen. Uh, we can't we can't get you clearly. I think uh, I, I should suspect that the there is a connection telling of your head, your mouthpiece, and the headset. So it's giving us a feedback. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, that, that's okay. okay so I. No way they are in this sector. I am aware that some media houses that are actually promoting corruption because they. Um, we we are still not getting clear audio from you. I don't know how best we can do it. Uh, is it is it possible that you can unplug the headset and the, the mouth? Speak directly to, to. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, this is okay. Okay, fine. Right. So, um, I was saying, uh, it has to start from the owners of the media houses because they have to understand why they're in the sector in the first place. But I'm aware of the media houses that are somehow condoning corruption because they know that their journalists cannot survive on what they're paying them. So, whatever they get through corruption, it only stops up. The little pay that they give them. So it has to start from these people. You you have to get into the sector to all, in order to add value to it and not to, to remove the value that, that it is supposed to hold. So we, these some of the owners, some of the media owners are a, a big uh, letdown in, in all this because I think you, you, you can have been functions uh, where the language among ourselves as media houses really shows the culture that of our, of our media houses. The culture that this media house 
promotes corruption. This Nili House does not promote corruption. So to me, it starts there. And, and, and of course, um, media bodies can come in, but uh, there's, a, there's just an extent to how much they can affect what happens within the media houses. Because as, as, as Teresa mentioned, you go to a media house, say, a new pay of people better, they say, we can't, what do you do? That's where you stop, you can just lobby. So the, the actual work, the actual decisions have to be made by the ownership, with the management, which includes editors, and editors have to, to enforce by force leading. And they are forced to lead by example, because sometimes editors can also uh, be a problem. Okay, uh, the, 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 perhaps the last question uh, from Claudia. I, I would love if we chair Teresa can tackle this one. Uh, she's saying, does the media need to play a role in educating the public about corruption rather than just reporting it? Because she's wondering whether just reporting on corruption creates a sense of despondency and normalizes corruption. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you, Claudia, that uh, we also need to take the role of educating uh, the society in terms of the evils of, of corruption and the cost of corruption to them as individuals. Because in the end, it can happen in, in high offices, but in the end, they will be the ones to feel it. They may not know it's, a, it's a, as a part of corruption, and that is where the media comes in. I think we need to... Uh, personalize the effect or the impact of corruption on a citizen as an individual. So when they get to know that, they will utilize their power much better to demand transparency and accountability. For us as, as Misa Malawi, for instance, we have been engaging the citizens across in promoting use of the access to information law, which became operational last year. And in trying to convince them of the need for them to demand information, to empower themselves to then demand for transparency and accountability from officials, public officials. We were using the example of, of corruption and trying to explain to them how that in the end will affect or impact their lives. And I think areas that we did those engagements, it was quite clear how they, they that the sense were quite eager. But I think it has to be done on a much larger scale. Edith will tell you, she is our representative or media representative in the Corruption uh, Bureau's committee, um, um, trying to, like, like a leader in sector in, in driving the sector's agenda against corruption. And uh, in those circles, they'll see and, and try to narrow down what the media can do to, to help in, 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 in this fight. So I, I think, yes, we need to do more in terms of educating. We have done it. Sometimes it's hampered, efforts are hampered by uh, issues to do with finances. Sometimes we will carry out our responsibilities because the SCB has paid for those uh, messages. But I think, yes, we need to create more space for us to talk about um, corruption. And I just wanted to touch on uh, the question that you asked earlier, Corey, uh, who, who should take the lead? And I think it should be shared responsibility. We should not say a particular office should lead us in this, but say media borders, professional borders, media owners should each play their parts. Uh, right now, the Media Council of Malawi is, for instance, advancing the fact that each media house have an ombudsman who will be able to receive complaints and handle them. And I think if we go that route, it will take a bit of some prep from the media owners, and this media person, media ombudsman, may, may be able to uh, then sort or solve issues to do with corruption as well. So maybe we should also be looking at that particular direction. Uh, okay, now I think I will give each of the three panelists 30 seconds to wind up with their closing remarks before we leave this place. I'll start with uh, Madam Editor Edith. Okay. Uh... I think for me, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the fight against corruption is, it requires concerted effort. We need the civil society to come in and help uh, the journalists. We need even security agencies. You know, journalism, uh, investigative journalism is a real threat to the lives of journalists. Some people will have the information, but they fear that what will happen after I expose this issue? Will I be safe? So we need security agencies to also provide that support to the media. 
We need politicians to be honest. We've seen politicians that are in opposition accusing the systems, but once they get into the system, they're doing the very same things that the people were against. So we want politicians to also realize that whatever uh, the journalists are doing is not, uh, is not a personal attack to them. It's just tr trying to put the right uh, things in place in, in society. So we need concerted effort in tackling this issue. And we also need media owners to own up to the challenge and, 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 and try and make, uh, create uh, an env environment that uh, helps journalists to thrive as they, uh, they, as they do their work in fighting uh, corruption. Uh, you turn, Grayson. Uh, you are you are muted. Unmute. Yes, I was saying. I think what we need basically is a, a culture shift. We need to have a new culture, and that is, we need to start from actually from our education. Uh, uh, our, our, our curriculum has to take this very seriously, um, because as I said at the, at the very beginning, it is, it's become normal. Uh, certain things have become so normalized, we don't even understand, we don't even know that they're committing a crime. So I think we need that cultural shift, and that has to start from the curriculum, both in our um, primary and school, but even in our journalism schools. I think the, the, the fight against corruption has to start from there. People have to come into the newsroom with a culture that, that, that aims at um, fighting corruption. So I think once we do that, then what chair said that every every player along the chain uh, will have to do their bit, whether it's uh, government, whether it's uh, uh, owners, whether it's editors, reporters, everybody, civil society, or everybody has to play their part. But what we need at the end of the day is the catch machine. Uh, closing remarks, chair. Um, I wanted to underscore the fact that for journalists who have done really well and are exposing corruption, it's a lonely place to be. It's a very lonely position because a very few Malawian journalists are exposing corruption. And because they're just very few, it's very easy for them to get targeted. Um, and we are endangering their lives. So my call is for fellow journalists to join the few that are already fighting corruption or doing something about fighting corruption, exposing it. Let them leave them uh, in the open because it's, since there are just a few of them, they will definitely be targeted. So I think we need to join our hands and uh, make more journalists um, tackle corruption or fight corruption, write about, about corruption. Um, so that, that is my call. And, and, and secondly, um, I would just age journalists. Problems will be there. Poverty will be there. But I think we should not lose our dignity simply because we have been faced with, with, uh, with um, uh, some financial challenges. Let us know why we are in the, in the profession in the first place. Why did you join journalism? And if we really are really honest with ourselves and know the reason we are in field, we should be able then to uh, do better and uh, fight corruption, not take part in it as well. Okay, um, I think we come to the end. Uh, it, it's unfortunate it's a virtual kind of meeting. I should believe that had it been, it was the traditional way of launching reports like this one, we are going to clap hands for a wonderful panel of guests that we, we've had, at which the discussion had continued, but due to time factor, we'll stop here. And I thank all that spare time to grace the launch of the State of the Newsroom report. Please, let's fight corruption as media. And thanks so much. Good afternoon. <laughs>